uh, continue to say your hellos, and I'm going to say officially, welcome to today's session, Happy Monday, kit number 130A, Blind Tasting Kit. Welcome to Master the World. I'm Lee Ming Stro, and with me today are three amazing master sommeliers, starting with my Hollywood squares here. Tim, Tim, will you say hello? Hi, everybody from New Mexico. Great to be here. Hope you're doing well. Wonderful. And then, of course, we have Madeline Trafon. Madeline, where are you coming from today? I am from Metro Detroit in my little uh, suburb of Southgate, and it's beautiful, sunny, and cheerfully humid. Great to have everyone here. And of course, last but not least, my business partner, Evan Goldstein, Master Sommelier. Where are you coming from today? Oh, I'm still in San Francisco. Haven't moved much today, although I was in Portugal a week or so ago, and I'll be heading to Vancouver on Thursday. So I am, in effect, um, <laughs> locked in today, but I am in the glorious and beautiful Bay Area. And I am here in the brand new offices of um, Master the World, where the paintings are not even up on the walls yet. And I hope that in a few short weeks, we can share with you guys a little bit more pictures of our um, new winery space that's gonna go into play. So very exciting. We're here in San Carlos, California. Uh, and yeah, lots of, lots of fun things going on here in Master the World. Quick shout out to everyone who's been a subscriber. Um, wanna thank you guys very much. And I, I know recently you got an email from me uh, to tell you about the, the goings on here. And, and again, really big shout out to everyone who supported us. We've shipped now uh, almost 30 kits. It's crazy, uh, <laughs> monthly kits. So thank you so much for being here. And we're excited to get this show on the road. So we have six wines for you today. Uh, for those of you who have the wine, wonderful. You can taste along. We'll have polls along the way. And of course, if you don't have the wine, our uh, esteemed master sommeliers here will be giving you clues along the way so that you can play along with the polls as well. So Madeline, you're going to kick it off for us today. I am indeed. Cheers to everyone's good health and good cheer and to your new digs, uh, master of the world. I can't wait to see uh, the finally polished, uh, the final polished uh, presentation. So um, picking up uh, wine number one, and uh, as always, a white surface is very useful in terms of assessing color. Sometimes people breeze through it, but I think it's something that uh, will, as I like to say, set you free if you get tied up in deduction. So this is um, a very bright, true pale yellow, um, I would say with some uh, green glints and a um, little bit of a silvered rim, so it appears to be young and uh, it moves uh, with velocity in the glass. So uh, again, per usual, the visual gives you a hint of what's to come, but this is not at the moment where, where we, desperate to decide what it is, are going to start drawing conclusions. And aromatically, it's extraordinarily forthcoming. Um, it just meets me, you know, 125% uh, the way out of the glass. I don't have to work for it at all. And I just get this wave of fresh, gentle, flowers. And uh, I'm defining them as citrus blossoms, apple blossom, lime blossom, and definitely fresh, no potpourri here. And then um, I think what I'm going to do is take it on the palate and see if I can connect the sense of smell to the sense of um, a taste right away, because as we all know, they're one and the same thing, because I am getting on the nose some pure, um, you know, an illusion of sweetness, um, key lime and Meyer lemon, but I want to see if that comes through uh, on the palate. And indeed it does. And quite often the nose will be so layered that I won't go straight ahead and take it on the palate. But in this case, I wanted to tie it together and the wine is beautifully balanced with, especially on first attack, some compelling acidity. Um, it lies light on the palate. I'm gonna take another quick taste immediately. And I'll tell you why. The first wine, the uh, structural elements, AKA acid, alcohol, and tannin are, are often overly dramatic and we adjust to it. So we definitely have mouthwatering acidity. I would characterize it um, as medium plus virgin on high, 
The citrus um, is both in um, the sweet uh, uh, floral citrus aromatic followed by actual citrus, key lime and Meyer lemon giving an illusion of sweetness and followed by both tree and stone fruit. You know, on my palate, it's coming through like yellow peaches and white nectarines. Um, there is uh, the hackneyed phrase, a strong uh, rocky minerality, meaning I'm getting a, a, a very clear sense especially on the palette of inorganic earth. Um, it's very pretty and balanced and the finish is long. There is a richness to this wine um, that I would um, say is probably coming from a combination of um, the stature of their vines, AKA low yields and age of the vines and also a richness that has to do with uh, Lee's contact. Have I forgotten anything? There is a little bit of an herbal element, again, verging into the illusion of citrus. So lemongrass, sorrel, verbena, that uh, style of wine, of uh, fragrance. Maybe just a kiss of tropical fruit, um, but more sort of um, pineapple, pineapple -y, sweet tart, as opposed to um, super ripe like mango and such. So my takeaway, the overview is that it appears to be a young, medium bodied, um, aromatic white with a strong fresh floral component and um, mirrored with an equally uh, distinct inorganic earth element. It has terrific length and it speaks of quality. Madeline, are you getting any grapefruit on the nose? Andrea Hoffman is asking. I do. I get a little bit. Um, I hesitated to say it. I didn't want to veer people in a very specific direction. There is some grapefruit, but it is. And, and thank you, Andrea, for bringing it up. Um, it's, uh, it's secondary. It's not primary on the citrus. And I think it's more of um, a gentle pink grapefruit as opposed to, you know, a bitter grapefruit rind. Also, um, there is a little bit of a phenolic component on this wine, a teeny little bit of bitterness, but it's, it certainly um, it doesn't drive the mouthfeel, the uh, acidity does. Wonderful, let's kick off the first poll. Okay, and I like this poll. Uh, and everyone, please, just a reminder, weigh in. You know, this is uh, anonymous and it's wildly useful to all of us to see um, your thinking. Uh, and the other is not a hollow option. Uh, if you really have been thinking about something completely different, please uh, choose it and we might ask you to see um, where you were going. We have Sauvignon Blanc, Albarino and Viognier, three aromatic white grapes, so nothing neutral here. One can make a case that Sauvignon Blanc um, is you know, highly aromatic. Uh, Albarino and Viognier, highly to semi-aromatic depending on the expression but you know this uh, gives us a lot to chew on because all three of those um, grape varieties can depending on where they're grown show us citrus and floral elements and then uh, I would um, counsel you to go back to the mouthfeel on this one because um, the mouthfeel will tell a story on this wine. Um, in terms of regions, again, whether you buy into what I'm perceiving in terms of minerality, whether you go to the old world or the new world, certainly um, if we're going um, Albariño, Albariño, we've got the option of Portugal. But when it comes to uh, Viognier, we could either go new world or old and Sauvignon Blanc ditto. Great, thank you, Madeline. I'm gonna give everyone just another 15 seconds and say this reminder, this is anonymous. So we don't get to see what you pick. Uh, I only see about 60% participation. Take a stand, take a stand and I, I guarantee you'll learn more that way. So closing the poll now, Madeline, I'm gonna share the results of the poll. This is where people are. 40% think that it's Sauvignon Blanc, 53% think that it's either Albarino or Alvarino, and we've got a 7% on that Viognier. No one thought there was anyone, anything else. So Well, nobody was intrepid enough to say so. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then, of course, um, on regions, I think it kind of corresponds to it because you've got mm -hmm. that 53% on Alvarino, you've got that on Portugal, and then you've got a split uh, mostly old world, if you add the 53 and the 27 together, mm. you're talking about an 81%, 80% of people thought that it was old world. So 
Do you want us to go to the region and talk from there or? I think so. You know, I think we're ready. Cool. Very pretty wine, very delicious wine. Put your seatbelt on, here we go. We are going to Iberia, Northern Portugal, right on the border with uh, Spain. Wonderful producer, Anselmo um, Mendez, uh, located in the sub-district of uh, Monsao and Melgasu. Hopefully my friend Evan, who speaks Portuguese fluently, will forgive me. But those are the two townships within this region. And it really is sort of the A++ going, growing region for this uh, grape variety, which is indeed Albariño, aka Alvariño in um, in Portugal. It is uh, very much at home. Here we are in um, Vino Verde. I had Evan, Evan to thank again for correcting me from saying what all of us say without correction, Vino Verde, right, which I'm sure drives the Portuguese crazy. It is, um, you know, within um, the, in the heart of um, the Minho. And again, the in the far north. Um, this is monovarietal. So this is a great variety that lends freshness and acidity and frankly class to a lot of blends um, in uh, Vino Verde and uh, other regions as well. Linity, uh, citrus, however you want to define it, herbs and 21. So I think it's balanced enough that you could have said Jane tells us a little bit about winemaking. Skin contact here, as I say that with a Greek accent. And um, though the skin contact is not um, a big part of the winemaking process, it is a short skin maceration. Um, beautiful, beautiful winery. And this is a producer that um, actually didn't start labeling with their own names on Selmo Mendez until 1998, uh, but is revered in winemaking circles in uh, Portugal. Those of you who thought it was Sauvignon Blanc, please don't wince because again, remember we said, these are, this is a highly aromatic wine. And it met me 125% of the way out of the class, right? And so is Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, the only thing I would say and why I hesitated really punching the grapefruit aspect is I think that that is, um, you know, one element of, uh, of this wine. Um, what else to bring to mind to bring this to life? Three years least contact with batonnage, thick skins. Um, and this was, just to remind us all, one of the uh, varietals that was one of the first to appear varietally labeled for white wine out of both Portugal um, and uh, Spain. So it's certainly well known. This, is, this gentleman's wines are not inexpensive, but they certainly deliver um, in the glass, no doubt about it. Um, gentlemen, do you want to go ahead? A couple of questions. Sure. Um, you mentioned the leaves and... Uh, Dipankar had asked a question, Tim had answered it too, is Lee's contact common for producing Alvarino Alvarino? Uh, Evan, you might know more than I do because you visited and Tim is giving a thumbs up. Yeah, I would no. imagine so because you often get that richness Absolutely. and you also get the bitterness that will come from uh, from the skin contact, yeah. correct? Yeah, and in this case, contacto refers to both the Lee's contact and the mm -hmm. skin contact together. So it's really a holistic term. Mm -hmm. um, because Alba Albarino or Alvarino tends to be sort of by itself a leaner grape, um, and picked usually early, you know, on the earlier side. Um, one of the ways you can amp up the body, well, there's two ways you could amp up the body. Number one would be putting oak on it, and there are oaked albarinos and albarinos out there, but many of the antagonists against that philosophy would tell you that all you taste is oak, but you could also leave the wine on its lees, batonage it, or even just rest it for an extended period of time, um, you know, get some autolytic uh, explosions going on there and pick up some texture there. So it is a fairly common uh, practice. What is probably less common um, is extended skin contact because you do pick up the phenolic elements right. in it and not everybody wants that. You know, yeah. somebody made a really um, uh, a cool comment about the green aspect, you know, uh, on this wine that led them to believe it was New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. The comment I would make is for me, it's the floral is more compelling and upfront 
And also, um, I don't get a, a strong cut grass, you know, uh, pushy element to um, the herbal aspect. It is in there, it is uh, secondary, and it doesn't command my attention. For me, at the end of the day, um, albariño, albariño has a florality. It has, is four square. It's got some weight to it without the use of oak. And this one's actually a pretty tender, elegant example. Would you uh, agree with that, gents? Tim, you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I once heard uh, Albarino described as Viognier nose and Riesling palette in that it's very floral, very pretty, a lot of pretty fruit. And uh, Mark made a comment and I answered him. To me, the Portuguese wines are, you know, just fruitier and, and more overt uh, than the Spanish wines. Or actually, just the opposite. The Portuguese wines are savorier. And they both have quite a bit of mineral. But to me, Albarino is uh, sweet and tart citrus. It's stone fruit like peak, peach and apricot. It's very floral. And yet it's got elevated acidity, but with, as Madeline has mentioned, the phenolics on the finish from skin contact. Just yeah. to stop it up, I think, Evan, the question on the table is this from Andrea and from Mark. Um, Andrea was very honest. She said she chose Portugal only because Spain wasn't listed. So I, I thought that was a great answer. And Mark also asked, as Tim pointed out, does Spanish Albarino have more minerality than Portuguese? Evan, I think maybe to sum it up, what is the difference between Spanish and um, Portuguese? Letter V. Just joking. <laughs> oh, no, seriously. Um, if you noticed on the picture before, you could see the you could see the river um, there, and it's one, literally on this just on two other sides of the border. So the aspects are a little bit different. I concur with um, Tim that that the Portuguese versions tend to be I, again, except in super ripe years, and obviously with climate change, that's hard to know what is ripe and what isn't. But they tend to stress um, a little bit more of the, the the linear fruit character. They're more savory. They're not as ripe. Um, the stone fruit here that Madeline pointed out, I think, is more on the underripe to just ripe fresh side, rather than the more overt nectarines and peaches that you're going to find in a classic albariño from Spain. The other reality is is that very very often, you know, it's, it, we have to pay attention to the labels, but, you know, in, in Portugal, in order to carry Alvarinho on the label, it has to be 100%. Um, it can't have anything else blended in it. Um, Alvarinho, um, I believe, can have a few percentage points of Durero or Trajadura or, or Trechadura, as they call it on that side of the world, Trajadura um, in, in that part of the world. Uh, the Portuguese part, but but generally, t and also they're going to have a little bit more roundness and texture. I find that the the, the wines coming from the Minho, if they're not actually listed as Vinho Verde, uh, tend to have more um, linearity to them. You know, one parting shot on this, because we're talking about florality, and certainly uh, Viognier and its, you know, very perfumey companions, uh, Muscat, Gewürztraminer, and the like, how do you differentiate? And to me, um, Viognier and those companions move more into uh, a perfumed character that can verge on obnoxious if it's really pushy. Where I think that Albarino, Alvarino is a more tender, fresh, subtle uh, reflection. And frankly, you know, we're talking about um, uh, if you're struggling with that, that's a good struggle. But I think this is such a good example of Alvarino, you know, aromatically that, um, you know, coupled with uh, the poignant uh, acidity and the strong minerality that it's worth memorizing even if you place it uh, incorrectly in Spain, my opinion. Yeah, the, gra the grape speaks to itself and I thought Tim's, Tim's comment was very, at once, uh, a very correct and also psychic. Um, literally, Albarino translates to uh, the Rhine, the land of the Rhine. And in fact, before they did the DNA work on it, they all thought it was Riesling because um, it had that sort of sleekness and, and brightness there. So they thought it was of the land of Riesling and hence that's why the name got picked up. But uh, obviously they found out they were two completely different grapes. And for those of you who were saying, the reason I picked Portugal was Spain isn't there, lest I remind you that Albarino is grown in California, it's grown in Uruguay, it's grown all over the world these days. So simply, um, and it's a great that, and now it's legal in Bordeaux, I might add. Um, so you can find Albarino increasingly as truly a global grape, much along the lines of a Sauvignon Blanc or a Chardonnay, and less um, completely uh, pigeonholed in Iberia.
I think Tim knows of a Viognier, taste of a Riesling. That's a great quote. To some okay. I can't take credit for that. That's actually Keith Golston's line. Ah, nice. Awesome. And it's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. He's a very it's, gifted. Uh, fellow master sommelier. Yeah. All right. Wine number two, guys. All right, well, let's, let's jump in here. Um, and I'd, I'd encourage you before uh, throwing your nose into it to take a look at it. And we have the luxury of being able to compare it in this case to wine one. And what you're gonna notice right off the bat and the two points I'd like to bring up in observation here are the color. The color is darker, uh, the color is richer. Um, and when you usually see darker color, it can speak to one of three things. One, the more, um, experienced you get at it, it might actually tell you the varietal a little bit because different varieties have different colors. But more importantly, um, white wines darken as they get A, older, or B, spend time in oak, or C, some combination thereof. So without even smelling this wine, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, that my proclivity would be to think that it's either A, older, or B, perhaps um, aged in oak. Now that I'm going to smell it, um, I think I get both answers correct on that one because I am picking up a touch of development on the wine, but I am definitely picking up some notes of earth. Now, when I speak to a, a wine, um, you know, and I always like following Madeline because, you know, I can be assured everything will have been covered by the time I get there. But I always tell people in a very simple form, um, I always look for a few things. F-E-W stands for fruit, earth, and wood. And those are the three general buckets uh, that everything comes under. When I say fruit, that means anything organically that grows out of the ground. So it can be fruit, but it could be vegetables. It could be flowers. It could be herbs. It could be anything out under there. So right off the bat here, I am getting fruit characters here. I am getting um, notes of citrus fruit for sure, um, but on the riper side. But more importantly, I'm getting again, um, stone fruit character. I'm getting some tropical fruit character uh, to the wine, more in the sort of um, uh, melony, guave vein. I'm definitely getting some sweeter citrus and I'm picking up on notes of things like um, apples, um, more in the yellow vein, quince, cooked, not raw, never eat raw quince not good for your stomach. And then um, again, a strong floral presence here. Um, various types of blossoms from the things we talked about before. And um, uh, yeah, and maybe a little bit of lily, maybe something like that too. Nothing green about this wine, nothing super vegetative about this wine, although there is something that you could describe as being perhaps um, chervilish or perhaps fennelish, those things being sort of slightly related in thing. As far as earth goes, I'm not getting anything that I would call classically minerally or classically earthy. I am picking up on something that um, is associated with an earthy thing. And that is just um, sort of a kiss of that sort of matchstick, um, sulfury, reductive element that um, I find in this wine too, which gives it sort of by... Uh, intent, a Burgundian flair to it um, and show some elements there. I'm picking a little bit of uh, ginger up. I'm picking up a little bit of like halava or, or something sort of sesame-ish in nature and um, just a little bit of interesting spices coming on from the, uh, what I perceive as being oak, a little bit of toast, a very soft smokiness. And um, again, some nuttier characters that are a combination of um, oak, and older development too, as wines pick up those nuttier characters as they age. In the mouth, just to sort of reaffirm all of this and then to move on to some other things. Getting a strong reiteration. Um, the fruit might come off a little bit more, um, dare I say, sort of baked or pie-ish uh, in the mouth there. Cooked fruit, pear, um, uh, pie apple, or poached, uh, poached pear or something like that, but ripe and um, really interesting. Um, the wine's got tremendous texture, roundness and body, which I would probably um, uh, attribute to combination of oak and probably smaller oak, but not overtly new and a combination of uh, leaf stirring um, and a combination of just thyme um, in oak as well to the sort of pick up roundness and body, slightly oxidative reaction between smaller oak. Um, the acid on the wine is, is, is solid. I'd say it's probably um, medium plus-ish. Um, I wouldn't put it quite at high today, the way it's showing. The length on the wine is still quite long. I can still taste it. I find the, be, the wine to be of um, very solid quality. And again, uh, with a tip of the proverbial hat beret or whatever to um, an effort to go Burgundian by nature. So that's kind of my thoughts there. 
All right. Well, where could we be? Let's take a look at what uh, Carmen San Diego says here. Um, certainly Chardonnay is an option. Um, that is going to be an option for all types of, of white wines based on some of the things we talked about before. That could fit. Torrentes, for those um, who are familiar with it, you know, is, is a very aromatic, very, um, if you were driving in Hawaii and you just got off the plane and you had a few too many uh, tropical drinks there, and you crashed your car into a farmer's uh, tropical market, and um, you then you ate your lay that they put on you when you got off there. That's Torrentes to me. Pinot Blanc can be one of many things. It tends to be a rich varietal, but also an austere varietal. And then once again, associations of those various grapes there. Realize that many of the time when we do these associations of grapes, it's not necessarily a one-to-one. -one. You know, Chardonnay's example could be grown in any one of those countries there. Um, ditto um, Pinot Blanc. And then again, if you have another choice, let us know, or if you were going in a different direction, let us know those are lovely conversation starters. And it's interesting to get in your in your brain and hear what you were thinking so we can either um, give you some direction or, or at least remark to why you ended up where you ended up. 10 seconds and I'll close the poll. And in the meantime, I just want to also, and looking at who's participating today, it's really exciting to see uh, some of our familiar faces and familiar names. But if it's your first time and you have additional questions, please don't be intimidated. Just drop them into the chat line. We'll be happy to answer any questions on how to use the grid, any of those kinds of things. All right. So I'm going to end the poll here, Evan, and share the results. All here right. Um, most of the world ended up, well, two thirds of the world ended up in Chardonnay. A couple of you took my lead on the Uber Tropical Torrentes, a few people in Pinot Blanc, and then a few others. And then most of the people uh, went, went to um, France, it looks like, although it looks like an equal amount went to Australia too. So um, we, had, we had two sides of that. And that's sort of an interesting um, thing because, you know, new world fruit and old world fruit um, can be very different. And particularly in a riper year, France can take on a more new world personality. But again, the intent and the desire uh, to make the wine in a decidedly old world style, perhaps um, threw a little bit of confusion into it. Some good choices there, some good rationale. I would, I would uh, kick out um, the Torrentes, only because I don't find the wine that tropical. Um, they tend to be um, extraordinarily terpenic and extraordinarily floral and extraordinarily exotic by nature, um, perhaps not as um, in a different way than the fruitiness of um, of uh, Viognier, but they tend to be just like remarkably floral wines and also with sort of notes of uh, lychee and stuff like that as opposed to sort of just the really ripe peaches and stone fruit that you find in Viognier. Pinot Blanc can be just about anything, but again, I think um, it tends to have a more linear character to that. Even when you barrel ferment it and Lee's contact it, it still tends to have more austerity than most Chardonnay. So I, let's see. I think this is a tough one, Evan. Um, I know, but you know what? The 50, world is an 50-50. Some yeah. of the people are in old world, some people are in old world. No, and that's great. And I think that's a wonderful conversation. And I look forward to having that one. When, when we reveal where in the world we are. Just one, one second, I want to uh, point something out. In chat right now, the best comment we've gotten all day is that this person, Van Kat, got a durian puff note. <laughs> That's for you. That's for you, Lena. <laughs> so for those of you who are from uh, Southeast Asia or know Southeast Asian uh, fruit, that's a very specific comment, Evan. Are you getting that durian puff? I, I am not getting a durian puff because you know my feelings towards durian. So no, <laughs> I don't I'm know not what getting... it is. Who, who's a durian? Would you describe it for us, please? A durian is a spiky fruit in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand. It's known as the king of fruit. It's super pungent. Yeah, and pungent so, is one way of putting it. And aromatic. Yeah, pungent. <laughs> it is the worst smelling thing I've ever experienced. It's a very, very expensive fruit. I, I love that this person used it here, Venkat. Wonderful gifts. I would go. I would go more um, jackfruit if I was going to go in that realm because it's not quite as pungent as uh, durian. But I could see where somebody for particularly for Torrentes, you might you might want to find it. But I would remind those people who are not familiar with durian that durian is so strong and so pungent that you cannot take it into a hotel, and you cannot take it on public transportation. It's illegal. And for good reason, too. There we go. All right. So on that All lovely right, durian away. note, let's find out. We're in Singapore. No, we're not in Singapore. Actually, we're in Australia. Um, and we are specifically in the Hunter Valley of Australia. And we are at a wonderfully 
time-honored winery, um, the family winery of Tyrrells. Uh, and Tyrrells, um, to me, is amongst the most Hunter Valley of the Hunter Valley in the sense that they source all of their fruit 100% from the Hunter Valley. The Hunter Valley is the closest appellation, if you will, to Sydney proper. So it's sort of like our version in Northern California of driving up to wine country for the day and spending it and then driving back home is what the Hunter Valley is to Australia. Because of that, there's lots of wineries there, but not a lot of fruit there. So a lot of people bring out of region fruit into Hunter Valley, make wines there, but their fruit's not local. The fruit from Tyrrells has been around since the winery was established soon after 1898. Um, and they started producing about 160 acres, I should say Edmund Tyrrell did that, the great, great grandfather there, and um, really established himself as one of the great leaders in this appellation. Um, it was uh, gone through multiple generations. The modern era, if you will, begins in the great year of 1961. I say that great year because it was a great year in Bordeaux. It's also my birthday year, so it made a great year too. Although the first Chardonnay didn't come out until uh, the plantings in, in 19, uh, soon after 1968. Fifth generation winery um, and just extraordinary. This is, so they, see they have balloon rides in the Hunter Valley, just like we do in Napa or Sonoma. But Cheryl's is, a, is an iconic spot. Um, the fruit for this particular wine um, goes back to Chardonnay. I mean, fruit goes back to your planting for a long time, but the Chardonnay vines literally in some cases go back to 1968. So there is some original Chardonnay fruit in this Hunter Valley wine. They're known for their, I believe it's Vat 47 uh, Chardonnay. That's Bruce Terrell. He's the sort of modern day uh, grandfather. His son, uh, Bruce, is kind of running it over there. But what's interesting about this wine is it probably runs completely counter to what a lot of people think about in Australian Chardonnay, which is sort of big, chewy, overdone, over oaky, over everything. And this wine shows at once restraint with ripeness. It shows a more Burgundian approach um, and it runs everything counter to, to what I think is sort of the very ripe lemon curd, tropical, um, apple pied nature with layers and layers of uh, torrified toffeed oak on it that um, you're sort of more, for lack of better words, uh, cheap and cheerful Chardonnay is today. This is definitely more serious side, um, showing, you know, the chamomile, the verbena, showing that the tree fruit that we talked about before, the stone fruits there, lots of blossoms. And then again, just a kitsch, uh, a kiss, if you have matched it. What I will tell you is that when these wines are released, and this has been in the market for, um, I want to say a couple of years now, they are so matchsticky and so reductive that you might think they were actually flawed. Um, because they're so pungent. But though that character does integrate over time as this wine does, this wine is now five years old. So literally about 24 months in, that starts to dissipate out. Um, and you'll find even in some of the semillons of this is a region that's known for semillon, that character can linger as well, but it uh, rewards the patient. And um, this is just a delightful example of, again, Hunter Valley Chardonnay made in Hunter Valley. Once again, I would tell you that if you go to any of these wineries and go to their rock concerts or picnics or um, summer festivals that they do, the lion's share of wine that they serve you, that they bottle, actually comes from other places in Australia. I want to say something as low as 15% of the fruit used to make wine in Hunter Valley is actually from Hunter Valley. You know, an overview comment I'd like to make, Evan, is how sleek and fresh this wine is. Mm -hmm. This is Southern Hemisphere 2017. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it speaks to a couple of things. It speaks to their technique, the quality of their fruit, uh, possibly Stelvin closure, and maybe you can address that as well. But also mm -hmm. there's definitely a salinity or a minerality in the aftertaste. So whoever was considering Maconet, don't flick yourself in the head about that. You know, mm -hmm. you got the grape variety, you got something that isn't over oaked and that um, uh, is showing actually, I think, younger than it is. Yeah. And if you look at what's going on in the Chalonnaise and the Maconnais these days, where really high quality producers are going down there and taking great fruit, you know, this wine shares a lot in, in common with, I don't know, Dominique Lafon's Macon. There's something to be said about that. I think that the, um, 
Whose wines can be equally reductive when they're Yes, young. very yes. reductive yes. as well, too, but due to, you know, simply long-term lease contact. But I think this wine does have a, a touch of minerality. I think it is probably echoed a bit by, by the reduction, but I do think that there's an elegance about this, and whether you're having Chardonnay from the Hunter, Chardonnay from the Yara, Chardonnay from Western Australia, there, um, this is a wine to sort of break uh, conventional thinking and paradigms that all Australian Chardonnays are these sort of big, blousy things, which, by the way, many of them used to be. I think today's more modern uh, style of Chardonnay, you use the word sleek, I think is a more apropos um, description. It's also a great buy, right? Yeah, it's, I think it's a pretty good value for the money. I did want to make it one quick observation, then I know Lee Meng will beat me if we don't move on, but the screw cap thing, you know, virtually all wines coming out of Australia, New Zealand, and a good amount out of South Africa um, are screw cap today, and screw cap will preserve freshness uh, for a longer period of time, and screw cap, by definition, um, mitigates any, for lack of better words, breathing or oxygen ingression, oxygen uh, stuff that happens as the cork uh, ages, so they're going to keep that sort of freshness and that um, uh, non-oxidative um, environment that wines are bottled under longer, hence the reduction or that match sticky character. So Evan, the two comments here and, mm -hmm. and Madeline kind of talk, touched on it on the Makane comment. I do think that people are looking for, here's a question from Dipankar, um, what are the markers you would look for to distinguish Australian versus some of these richer style, you know, Makane type of um, uh, yeah, I, I, I would say that the, the wines that come from Europe uh, or, or France and specifically Burgundy tend to be more citric. This to me is really more decidedly about the tree fruit uh, first, the tropical fruit secondarily, and the winemaking intent being a Burgundian third. So there is a slightly riper citric nature, but if you were to have a wine from the Maconay, from uh, the Chalonnaise, from even the southern part of the Côte du Bonne, um, you would have decidedly more citrus elements to it. And the tree fruit elements you have would be decidedly less ripe unless you were in a particularly warm year, like say, I don't know, 19 or something like that. Great, awesome. All right, Tim. Yes. Hey, everybody. So we're to wine number three, which is the first red wine. And we're going to take a look at it over a white background. Uh, it is, uh, we're going to call it a medium plus deep ruby, fading to a lighter and more above vault color uh, on the rim with a little garnet in it. So this wine is not exactly young, but maybe evolving, a few years old. Uh, that difference in color is called rim variation, right? The difference between the core color and the edge color. And then beyond that, um, you know, it is almost clear. You can almost read through it. And besides that, the legs, tears, la-di-da, Marangoni effect, probably medium. So everything kind of pits together. It's not a really deep, saturated, concentrated wine, but some something a little less. And then in terms of nose and palate, um, <laughs> it's a combination of a lot of different things. So here we have a wine that where the fruit is really not dominating right off the start. And in terms of what kind of fruit, and when you're tasting red wines, it's good that you should list the color of the fruit first. Is it red, blue, black, or dried? Uh, and then what kinds? And here we've got kind of three of those four, no blue fruit, but there's definitely red fruit. And here I describe it as red plum and red cherry maybe cranberry things that are sour, but also we have a combination uh, and this points to the evolution in the rim color of, uh, you know, the fruit quality is, let's just say it's a combination of ripe and evolving drying. So it's not exactly fresh. Same goes for the black fruit, black fruit, uh, black plum, blackberry, and maybe black cherry, but again, they are ripe and they're just this side of fresh. They're not fresh anymore, they're evolving. And then finally, there's some dried fruit. So there is some raisinated type elements to the wine. And once again, that speaks to the age. Okay, so that's only one part of it. Above the glass, there's some dried rose petals. There's a floral component. Not only that, there are secondary notes, a lot of them herbal. Uh, to me, dried bay leaves, laurel, uh, maybe some savory basil, dried basil. And from there, then we might go into the earth and mineral, and there are both here. So we've got a, a mushroom, dark turned soil, but also there is some mineral quality to it. So again, I want you to take everything I've just said, and I haven't gotten to the wood yet, and I'll do that very quickly. There's no wood at all, right? So there's no smoke toast, 
spices, walnut, all that stuff. There's a touch of oxidation to the wine, but that speaks to the fact that, again, once again, the wine has aged a little bit. It's not bright, fresh, and young. Now, of all those things that I've just talked about, ask yourself, percentage, how much of it was fruit? And the question is really, how much does fruit drive this wine versus everything else? Because that's a major decision that's coming up in just seconds. In terms of the structure, mm, there's something surprising about the wine that gives it away to me. Because of a lot of red fruit, the wine is not really acidic. To me, the acid is just almost medium plus. The alcohol, when I say, oh, and inhale, it's medium. It's probably 13, 13 and a half. Okay. Uh, the tannins are medium too. They're supple. Uh, it's very pretty wine, very complete. Uh, and it's easy to drink. It's delicious. And at the same time, there's a lot of interest to it. It's very savory. And when I mean savory, that's a term that the Brits use. I mean, it's not everything else that's beyond fruit. So everything that is herbal and floral and on and on and on. So that's what I refer to when I say savory. Okay. With that, Li Ming, it's time for the envelope, please, or the poll. Okay, now here are your choices. Hmm, those three choices are very interesting. I call them the evil dwarves, because there are three <laughs> members of a group of red grapes that often confund students. But I will tell you, the most important thing here is not the fruit, because it's predominantly red across the board with those three but it is the non-fruit and the structure, and also in some cases, winemaking, okay? All right, so with that, take a look. And then I when you can- I wanna make a comment with... here. For those of you who use our quick picks and notice that our quick picks have different choices than these uh, over here, it's because here you have three master sommeliers ready to explain to you when you have very close differences between Gamay and Pinot and Dolcetto. At home, you don't have that, so we try to have at least one quick pick that's kind of easier um, in, in that setting. And if you're looking at it from the full workout mode, they're actually available as hints. So that instead of looking at a list of like 15, 18 different varieties, you could just be looking at those four. So there is a difference between the quick picks here and the quick picks in our poll, if you will. Okay. All right, I think- sure. We are going to end the poll. Uh, mm -hmm. We have about a 60 plus percent participation and I'm gonna share the results. Here we go. Okay, so everybody, yes, as you're looking at this, let's go to the bottom page first and work backwards, yeah? So everybody went to Italy or they went to France. What is that? That is 85%, that's good because everybody, my point was is that the non-fruit type things dominated the wine. Yeah, they really did. So that would put you in the old world almost always. There's always exceptions, right? Uh, now to go up to the top, here we go. So uh, people who went to Gamay, if we're talking about Gamay and wine that looks like this and has the weight and the structure, you're talking Beaujolais Village. And there are two things missing for Beaujolais Village. They are carbonic maceration, which would give it the tutti frutti, Jolly Rancher, uh, candy, candies type thing and the tropical fruit punch, but also stem inclusion, because if you have whole clusters of grape during fermentation, you got stems and that stem inclusion. Both of those things are missing. Pinot Noir to me, this is, you know, this is, wine is very, very savory and has a mix of different fruits and especially that raisin quality. And they wouldn't expect to see that or find it in a Pinot Noir of this age, which leads us to the last choice, which is Dolcetto. So now let's Take a look at the map, and as Madeline says, fasten your seat belts, because we're going to a country where I could spend the rest of my life eating and drinking and be really happy. <laughs> oh, and we're going to Piedmont in South, South Northwest Italy, excuse me. Uh, and this is Domenico Clerico, which is one of the great Barolo producers. Uh, the, the winery is founded in 1976. Domenico Clerico, he was a visionary for Barolo. And this is their Dolcetto, which is from different vineyard sources. But I just a shout out here because Domenico, again, was a visionary who was one of the first in Barolo to start bottling single crews or vineyards as far back as the 70s. And he had that foresight and he changed Barolo forever. And also he was one of the first to use small barrels, eventually barriques, 
uh, to age his Barolos in, which made, made them at one point very traditional in terms of site specific and yet very modern at the same time. So this wine is called Visadi, which means vision. It's made from several different uh, plots. And uh, to me, it's quintessential Dolcetto. And one of the things that, you know, Madeline and Evan and I were talking about is that Dolcetto gets a bad rap as being like the Beaujolais of Italy. And you can tell from this, it's not because it is, it is certainly quaffable because of the structure, but there's so much going on in the wine that I, this is delightful. And it's just so interesting. You spoke, if you don't mind my speaking up about the tannin acid, and I think you said it so beautifully and it, and it bears repetition because we always read this, you know, with Dolcetto at its best or most classic, I guess, more um, poignant tannins than acidity and the opposite with Barbera. And I, I think you have to listen closely to this wine in its structure, but I think it tells the truth. And that's another reason for me, uh, you know, I would eliminate Gamay because the quality of the tannin um, is different. And also the only argument I'd ever have and I very ever, ever argue with you, Tim, is that uh, sometimes the better uh, Gamay's won't show carbonic, you know. Um, yeah, that's true. So, so just Matt, the, the Cru Beaujolais, yeah, the Cru Beaujolais won't. Cru Beaujolais, the Cru Beaujolais yeah. won't. But I really liked how you brought attention to the the, the mouthfeel of this wine. Yeah. Quality of fruit's killer. Yeah, well. and, and what's what I love about this wine, it's it's uh, Dolcetto is, is Piemontese dialect for little sweet one. Um, and <laughs> one of the things that you'll note, and it's still there, there's still sweetness to this fruit. There's, uh, you know, I, I love the fact that it's starting mm -hmm. to, get just to catch the first three or four gray hairs at its temple as it develops a little bit of venosity. But there is a succulence about this wine too. And the other thing that I thought, you know, when you're looking at why is it not Pinot Noir, why is it not Gamay, both of those two grapes have much uh, sharper acid levels. Dolcetto, even in its youth, is never what I would call a sharp wine. It is, once again, quote unquote, the little sweet one. And um, that's how I, I bird dog it there. If I'm getting a wine that has structure, that I'm sitting there, um, you know, waffling and uh, vacillating between the, the three and I'm missing the acid, that's when I usually will, will end up in Dolcetto. Um, this is the family, uh, Juliana, uh, the great matriarch at this point in time and her, her winemaker, Oscar. Um, but what's interesting, what a lot of people don't know, and Tim brought up the fact that, yes, I mean, if you talk about literally the, the, the inflection point of Barolo some 30, 40 years ago plus, um, it was in large part due to uh, the clericos and, and a couple of other families that did it. But the only land they actually owned in the family that was passed on was the Dolcetto Vineyard. So they've acquired uh, over time and done this. But this was the first wine they made. It has a, maybe it's not as uh, complex and age-worthy as their Barolos are, but it's a wine that if you talk to the family is near and dear to our heart because it's their DNA, which I love. Yep, yep. absolutely. All right, so uh, just you know, to reiterate, I did a little typing. So, Gary, this uh, wine was done in completely in stainless steel, right? And probably was not kept in after it went through malolactic. Probably was bottled fairly quickly. And then Andrea, in your question about thought it was young CVP, we're going to answer that with the next wine. I promise. Okay. All right. Shall yeah. we go to one number four? Uh, sorry, Tim. We have another question as a follow up to your stainless steel All comment. Right. Are dolcettos always stainless? Uh, no, they're not. And, and you know, that's generally true for any wine. Yeah, unless it's New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. If it's not stainless, you know, in terms of dolcetto, and also think about it, you know, the cost of wine, uh, you know, if you're going to put wine in really expensive oak, it's probably really good, certain grape varieties, and it's going to cost a lot of money because really good oak is expensive, right? Uh, so if that's the case, if this, you know, some dolcettos are maybe the primary ferment in stainless steel and they go through malactic and then they're put in huge old oak uprights and they're kept for three months, six months, nine months or whatever. So it really depends on the producer. Uh, traditional was always old wood and stainless steel, obviously, if you think about it, is something that's not modern, but certainly within the last 30 to 40 years. Great. Um, a question here. Is there any cardboard in anyone's wines? No. Okay. Nope. Uh, I think okay. it's 
interesting that uh, we have a lot of newbies to Dolcetto. Uh, it's awesome, Evan, for introducing something new. No, I mean, one of the yeah. things that people Delicious. should remember, and it's, it's a reiteration if this is uh, old hat to you, Master of the World, but if you're new, we always do, you know, we're about education. You know, yes, we help Jedi Knights in training, but we're all about education first. You're always going to find usually one per kit, something that's going to stretch you a little bit, but nevertheless bring you and keep you in something. Chetto is as much a part of the DNA as... Um, as uh, you know, as Nebbiolo is, and arguably Bar Barbera is to this part of the world in, in Piedmont. Um, increasingly, perhaps a little bit less so, but I think that's unfortunate. Um, as Tim pointed out, I, I can quaff Dolcetto all day long and enjoy it with uh, plates of salumi, uh, my good friends, and all of that, and, and uh, anything I throw on the barbecue. So I'm a happy, perfect. Glad I know, people and are you can always. It. You can always ask yourself, is this good wine as opposed to what is it? I mean, the, the beauty mm -hmm. about blind tasting is just that. It doesn't just have to be this laser sharp, you know, uber focused to the point of sometimes we get crazy about it, you know, deduction. It can be a more relaxed overview thing where if you've never had a dolcetto of this quality, how cool to recognize the thumbprint of a great producer uh, and the potential of a great variety that... Uh, is um, occasionally undervalued. And underappreciated. Yeah. All right, Tim, wine number four. All right, everybody, wine number four. And now for something completely different as they say on TV. Oh, so everybody, as you take a look at this wine over a white background, notice less color, less intensity of color. And we're gonna call this a true ruby red, probably medium minus ruby red, and it lightens up to a very pretty pink or salmon pink, <sighs> Li Ming, I said salmon. And anyway, and, and also the, the tearing legs, medium, just like the Dolcetto, but in this case, no coloring whatsoever. And yes, I think that's about it. And then on the nose, okay, so it's not a technical term, but I can describe this in one word, yummy. It's yum, <laughs> <laughs> smells delicious. Um, this is like, a, you know, a strawberry cherry sweet tart for adults. Okay, so the fruit here is predominantly red, practically all red. So it is ripe and tart strawberries, cherries, cranberries. There's a hint of black fruit, but it's just a touch. It's almost all red fruit. Um, and in the condition, again, it is ripe and tart and it's fresh. The, there is a very pretty rose top note to the wine. And um, other than savory herbal type things. There is tea, black tea, there's orange rind, uh, there's a little ginger spice. There are, you know, herbs like uh, California bay laurel. What else on, on here? Maybe some green olive is a good call as well. In terms of the earthiness in here, if you think this wine is earthy, guess what? You need to go back to wine three for a reality check, okay? Because <laughs> wine three is pretty earthy. This wine, by comparison, has touches of turned soil, uh, a little touch of minerality, but not much beyond that, okay? There's a little mushroomy quality, too. I also think there's, you know, it reminds me of star anise or red licorice, and maybe even a touch of black licorice, too. How this wine is different from wine three is that it definitely has some oak aging. So it's mixed, predominantly used oak, but there's a touch of new oak on it right? And I know that there's a touch of vanilla, there's some brown baking spices, uh, there's a little cocoa, and, uh, and also along with that oak, there's a little bit of oxidation, and that's like hazelnut and walnut and things like that, okay? Um, and then I'm going to taste it real quick for structure. Mm. And there's something important when you taste the wine and that there's stem inclusion, okay? So whatever this is in terms of grape, where it's made, et cetera, rather we see some whole cluster or partial whole cluster fermentation, which means you have stems, which means you have the green stem tannin on the palate. In terms of structure, the wine is dry. The alcohol, is, again, is medium, probably about 13, 13 and percent. The acid though is higher than wine three, medium plus. The tannins though are medium and elegant and fine. Everything about this wine is seamless and it's very restrained, it's elegant and it's delicious. Um, that's, I guess the best word to describe it. The finish is medium plus. Uh, again, if we could drink the Dolcetto all day long, we could do that with this wine too. 
Um, this wine though would be just wonderful with a lot of different foods. Okay, Li Meng, we're ready for the poll. So here are your choices. And again, I wanna point out, and I'm being shameless here because I have a book coming out in 60 to 90 days called Message in the Bottle, A Guide to Wine Tasting. One of the chapters is called Confronting the Evil Dwarves. OK, and it's about <laughs> confusing red grapes. And here are three of them. And this is where I'm getting back to someone's question about the last wine and a CDP, a Southern Rhone blend. OK, so for Pinot Noir, of course, red fruit dominant, elegant, you know, softer tannins, medium plus acid and a lot of, you know, non-fruit but red fruit dominant. Gamay, once again, this weight would be something like Beaujolais Village with carbonic and with stem inclusion, but it, this lacks, you know, the carbonic. And finally, Grenache blend, hmm, Grenache Southern Rhone is probably what we're looking at, would have a lot of earth and mineral type components. It would also be just from structure, the alcohol would be 14, 14.5% or higher, and the wine would be more tannic. There would be a lot of pepper and dried beef and all sorts of savory type elements. Uh, it's just a bigger wine. Okay, now that I've telegraphed it, <laughs> Go ahead and cast your votes for your favorite. Okay. I'm going to share okay. our results. Actually, we've been we've been casting votes through your uh, very very uh, helpful hints here. I we hope have, they were helpful. Okay. We have a 50% on Pinot, but you still have a 40% on the Grenache. So there is okay, still so, a confusion between that. Yeah, so everybody, you know, it's just it's just not ripe enough and big enough for a Grenache blend from the Southern Rhone. And also, everybody, as you're turning, I advise you to go back and taste the Dolcetto now. Taste it and swallow a little bit and see how earthy it is. And now go to this wine, wine four, and it really almost lacks earthiness whatsoever. So there's really no way you can take this to the old world, okay? Yeah, and you have the 60-40 here, 40% 40 old world and 60% new world. So it's definitely... Yeah. Uh, confusing. Okay. This is a great teachable moment. And that's, I'm sure this is one of the reasons Evan put these two wines next to each other because they're very, very stark AB comparison. Yeah. All, right, All right. So uh, fasten your seatbelts. And we're going to go to the Sonoma Coast near Fort Ross. And this is the, the you know, the, you know, the justly famous Hirsch Vineyards. Uh, David Hirsch, really one of the people who put this appellation on the map. A winery started in 1980. He and Jasmine just make superb Pinot Noirs. Uh, to me, some of the best in Northern California. And um, you can see ridge top, you know, above the fog line. And I think you could even see the ocean there. That's there's a joke there somewhere. <laughs> okay, so. There's the map that shows you in the north northern part of uh, Sonoma Coast. And then let's get to the pictures because they're beautiful photographs. Evan, Evan's cat. Like it's, it's Evan's <laughs> cat. It actually is. Evan's cat. Uh, personally, and you can see the fog line. You can imagine what that does to diurnal temps, you know, in terms of hottest and coolest. Really, you know, prolongs the day getting hot. Um, keeps acidity in the grapes and acidity in the finished wines. And then I think we have a picture of David and Jasmine coming up. Yeah, I, I don't think one can underscore how important and vital uh, this family is towards the establishment of, of sort of the northern part, that Fort Ross Seaview area of uh, yep. what we refer to as the West Sonoma Coast these days. Um, it's, uh, you know, they, for those of you familiar with Hirsch, they make multiple Pinot Noirs. This is their sort of ode to a village wine. So it's supposed to be a little bit more approachable, it's supposed to be a little mm -hmm. bit more juicy and yummy to, to quote Tim and not necessarily be you know, the San Andreas Fault or, or one of their like plot wines that are, you know, anticipated to be consumed in multiple years. This wine is, I think, at its apex right now. I think it'll mm -hmm. hold for a while, but I just think it's yeah. um, gorgeously speaks to uh, an appellation in the way that a commune wine does in Burgundy or a village wine does in Burgundy. And that, that, that's actually on their website when they talk about it. Um, and they've done just an amazing job. And as over the years, David has handed the, the, the reins over to Jasmine and she's just taken it from strength to strength. 
quality of the fruit is just stunning on this wine. And I want to encourage the people that are sitting there depressed because they called it old world. Because, <laughs> you know, the comment that I made to myself before we actually got on is that this is an example of a wine to me um, that is could have been made, uh, 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 you know, by the hands of a very modern, very forward thinking, young um, old world producer or a new world producer who had very much old world sensibility. I mean, I think especially mid palate, the fruit speaks new world big time, but there's a complexity and a depth to this wine that I think might nudge, nudge you uh, to Europe. You may or may not agree with me on that, Tim, but I'm complimenting the wine. You know, I think oh. especially for their village level, whoa, you know. There are two questions here. Uh, first question from Jane. Doesn't this seem a little prematurely oxidized for such a young new world wine? Tim, how would you answer that? Okay, so, you know, that's a great question. I would just say anytime that you're tempted to uh, say something's a little oxidized, think about a wine that's truly oxidized. So, you know, red wine that's truly oxidized, I mean, the fruit is dried and raisinated and dead, right? So this to me has a little hazelnut, walnut, um, and softer fruit character, and the fruit is no longer almost fresh, but I'm not so sure I would say it was oxidative because it's still fairly young and fairly fresh, and you would see that in the color right off the bat, and the color here is still really youthful and vibrant. So I would just say, you know, if you're tempted to think about that, think of an extreme and see if you can get there with the extreme. And if not, you know, maybe it's just the character of the wine, because uh, more often than not, especially with Pinot Noir, you're making it, you're fermenting it in small open top fermenters. And so you've got a lot of oxygen in contact with the must as it's fermenting. So you might have certain elements that you might think were oxidative, but overall the wine to me is still pretty fresh. That, I just talked in a big circle, so I hope I answered the question. <laughs> did, you did. And uh, you've answered the Pankras question. For those of you who are trying to distinguish between stem tannin and uh, tannin, uh, grape tannins, I think Tim has done a great job in the chat. Uh, here's another question for you, Tim. Uh, do you get black tea? Uh, Venkata is getting black tea. Is this common in Pinot? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and really for... Pinot Noir from basically everywhere. Uh, to me, you know, tea and black tea uh, is, is a very common marker, you know, in non-fruit for Pinot Noir. Yeah, good call. Great, great, wonderful. Okay, so I think, Evan, we're going back to you, right? Yeah, yeah, just two, two closing comments there. And, and thank you, Tim, for taking us through that uh, delish wine. And yes, the cat on the label does look like my cat. So my family seems to believe that that's the only reason I picked the wine. But if you tasted the wine, you know that that's not the case. Um, two things. Number one, pinots that come from the true, if you quote unquote, call it Sonoma Coast, tend to be leaner and more savory than those coming from the interior Russian River Valley. I think when most people think Sonoma County Pinot Noir, they think sort of middle reach, warmer Sonoma, Sonoma County, and they do have a slightly richer, more fruit forward if that you took the volume you know if the volume on this wine is at about a four a lot of the volume on california pinots tend to be at eight or nine and which really brings the fruit out there and this wine shows more restrained it also shows more of that savory character a little bit of that constant common tea i think whoever said that made a good observation and again that sort of green tan and echoing sort of the conifer pine cone character i tend to find in a lot of the sonoma coast uh, pinots but anyway on to something different right off the bat you look at wine number five and you know Notice there's a density and volume of color that you haven't seen in the past two wines. So right off the bat, you're probably expecting something that's going to be bigger. Um, the color is still youthful. Um, there's very little variation out to the edge, and the edge itself is almost a magenta sort of color. There's a purpleness to it, which once again probably suggests some youth. And as you roll the wine around inside your glass, as I'm doing here, or swirl it around and watch the tears fall down the inside of the glass, you'll notice that there's some staining there, which once again uh, suggests some extraction. Uh, could be warmer fermentation, could be the nature of the grape, etc. But bottom line is this is going to be, I would expect, a quote-unquote bigger wine than the last two that we've had. As we swirl it and sniff it, right off the bat, um, this wine, as the color sort of suggests, him I think gave you the, the quick uh, down and dirty. If it's uh, red wine uh, in color, go with red fruit. If it's a darker wine in color, go to black and blue fruits. And this one is definitely more black um, than it is red. There's certainly some riper red cherries, red plums, and red currants here. But I think there's uh, they're overwhelmed 
by the fact that you've got black cherries, blackberries, black currants, cassisi-like flavors across the top. Um, they are at once fresh, uh, ripe, and maybe um, just sort of pushing a touch on the slightly overripe character. Um, no real stone fruits, no real citrus fruits, a lot of floral. And I'm getting purple flowers in particular here. You want to call it lavender. If you want to call it violets, there's definitely something pigmented as far as the flowers go. Um, and then I'm getting to the other side of fruit which is the non-fruit fruit. So in this case, there's definitely elements of green, um, whether you want to call it chard or chicory or mixed greens like you can buy and you know throw them in a, in a, in a saute pan. I'm definitely picking up that element there. I'm picking up some peppers, uh, but not green jalapeno-ish peppers, more like the sweetness of red and yellow bell peppers in this wine. I'm picking up a, a kiss of something that I would call sort of cola nut, which is at once kind of vegetable, but sort of sweet, also sort of sarsaparilla-like in nature. And then I'm clearly picking up um, sort of a turned earth character, but not a strong minerality to it. There is some minerality there, but not super strong. Um, and then I am, but there's definitely like a forest floor turned earth character. Um, a lot of, uh, of rich uh, oakier flavors some clove, a little bit of dill, uh, perhaps a kiss of, of, of smokiness to it. And um, generosity, just a wonderful, sweet uh, character of oak. I'm picking up tobacco leaf. I'm picking up bay leaf. I'm picking up, as I said before, chicory, which those of you spent any time down in New Orleans and finished your evening with a cup of uh, coffee and chicory at Cafe Du Monde, eating beignets at three in the morning, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. Then in the palate, The wine is this wonderful dance of wonderful ripe fruit, round um, sweetness of the oak, this sort of strong undercurrent of, of, of uh, green, but not green in terms of underripe, green in terms of green vegetable, green in terms of herb, fresh herb, dry herb a little bit, and then um, framed by this wonderful, uh, beautiful character of lovely oak and with a depth of uh, fruit character that suggests to me old vine, which I only find in old vine wine. The tannins are smooth, they're creamy, the wine is round, the, uh, the, the mouth weight in the middle palate and in your, my chest cavity right now is sort of medium full in body, the wine is long, the wine is delightful, the wine is complex, uh, and the wine sings. Um, there doesn't speak to a lot of different things. It's not a rock and roll band here, you got somebody on lead vocals here who can really shout it out, but they're doing so. Um, dominating everything else in a good way. All right. What do we like got that, here? I like that lead vocal uh, analogy. That's yeah, really it's kind of like Robert Plant in front of Led Zeppelin when everybody else goes quiet. Uh, so we've got Carmen Air, uh, either pure or as a blend, Cabernet Franc, either pure or as a blend, and Malbec, either pure or or is in a blend. And once again, um, we pick these up here. It doesn't necessarily say when we say blend that they are blends, but they could possibly be blended or they could be mono varietal wines or they could be driven by a variety with a few other percentage points of grapes in between as we know to be labeled as such in those countries, not California, not USA. They have to be 85% in the great state of California, 75%. In the USA, great 75%. So you've got some choices there. Um, what Cabernet Franc and Carmen Air share in common is more of that greener thing. What Malbec shares in common is more of that succulent purple thing going on there in a lot of the floral characters. And then again, obviously associated countries along the way, but you could go in a couple of different directions. There are markers to all of those wines in this particular glass, but I do think there's one thing that really does, in my mind's eye, give it away. All right. I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm going to close the poll very quickly here. So the last five seconds for those of you who are still deliberating. Five, four, three, two, one, and. All right, here we go. Here's your, here are the results. I think uh -oh. Evan, people are mostly split between Cabernet Franc and mm -hmm. Malbec, some in the common Cabernet world, mm -hmm. but definitely New World. Yeah, and I think that the New World does scream uh, in this wine there, in the sense that there is not a sort of stoniness, a rockiness, 
for this genre of varieties, many people probably associate it with cedar and cigar boxes and graphite and all of those other terms that sort of speak to this camp of varietals. All of those varietals up top, um, albeit a secondary, are in the Bordeaux family, if you will, of varieties. Cabernet Franc tends to be the, 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 the more sort of bay leaf, dark, dark fruit, but with a lot of red fruit too, I might add too, if you go to Bourgogne or to Chinon, or even in, in, in some versions of, uh, you know, saint Emilion or something, you're going to find that there. Um, Carmenere tends to be very, you know, more, more green, um, sometimes really green, sometimes too green. And then Malbec, as I said before, very purpley. If Malbec uh, was a flavor or purple was a flavor, it would be Malbec. That's what I always tell people. All right. So where do we end up? Let's hit our, our, our spinning wheel, Vanna, and let's go out there. The world turns as the world turns, still my favorite soap opera to the day. We end up in South America and we end up in Chile and we end up in Colchagua and we end up in the province of Santa Cruz in the property of, uh, in the subzone of Apalta and uh, at the house of La Postol. And for those of you who understand um, Colchagua, this is actually a great view. You sort of see it almost as kind of like a little bowl. It's almost like a little amphitheater thing up there. And if you were at the property that is in fact, um, uh, Aurelio Montes' Apalta Vineyard, it literally looks like an amphitheater slightly further up, but the whole thing is sort of a little bit bowl-shaped here. La Postol uh, is some of the older vine area of Apalta. Apalta itself, as I said before, sits in Santa Cruz, not to be confused with Santa Cruz down south where they surf and eat saltwater taffy um, or go to the boardwalk. But uh, Apalta is a particularly special plot. It's got some of the oldest vines, not only in uh, Colchagua, but in um, all of Chile. In fact, this particular property dates back to somewhere between 1910 and 1945. And the, there's vines in here that are well over 100 years old, which contribute to the depth of this wine. It is pure Carmenere, 100 um, percent, and pure Apalta. What's interesting about this wine which is a 2020, as you're picking up the youth, you could see that in color. You're picking up the youth in terms of the primariness of the fruit here, but you are getting this sort of very intense uh, depth, uh, tight knitness, tautness of, of fruit character there. What gives away Carmenere to most people is again, very much the way I'm gonna go back where I started. We have this old preconceived idea of what Australian Chardonnay is about. We have this old preconceived idea about what Carmenere is about, which basically tastes like um, broccoli and green peppers and all these very unpleasant pyrazinic things. That's true if you overcrop it. That's true if you grow it in a climate that's not too warm. And that's true if you'd ask of it something that it's not, which is to be a prolific producer. But if you scale it in soils that are a little less generous, if you green harvest and cut your crop back and you keep it in a warm climate, you're gonna get a wine that is beautiful. So for Mark, you're saying here, this wine was, was tough. Yeah, this is not, this, not every wine is gonna be a gimme here, but this wine very much along the lines of the Dolcetto here before is to show you that um, preconceived notions are not always the same thing. The La Postel team here, uh, Charles uh, de Bourbouet is the, uh, the gentleman on the right. He is the daughter of uh, his father and Alexandre Marnier Lapostel, she of Grand Marnier. Uh, he is the seventh generation of the family. He's the general manager. Uh, the woman in the uh, Patagonia vest there is Andrea Leon, who is now, quote unquote, the technical director, but really is the heart and soul uh, behind there, inherited the reins uh, as assistant winemaker from Michel Roland back in the old days and has rocked with it since. Paola uh, is her, uh, her uh, winemaker uh, on the uh, right-hand side, and then Igor handles all of the viticulture and does a great job and is considered one of the great viticulturalists of uh, all of uh, the Colchagua area. Um, this is a wine to change your mind. If, if, there, if there was a theme about this kit for several of the wines, it was change your mind. Australian Chardonnay, change your mind. Dolcetto, change your mind. And Carmenere, change your mind based on tasting really good examples of what they are, as opposed to perhaps the less paradigmed examples of the modern interpretation that you, um, that you have today. The one thing that makes this stand apart is, albeit not 
green per se in an underripe pyrazinic way, you're always going to have a, a blonde or green tobacco leaf. You're always going to have a chicory character. You're always going to have the sort of mixed greens that you saute up as part of Carmen Air. Here, what you're doing is growing it in the right comment, pulling out the fruit and limiting the yield so that your fruit the black cherry, the cassis, the currant, the savory elements that you would associate with Bordeaux are as apparent as that otherwise um, pyrazinic uh, pile that most people would associate in cheap uh, old Carmen air of the past. Yeah. I, I think just to be clear, um, Evan, Gary's asking how this wine stands apart from the other choices. So you're saying how this common era stands apart from right. other common eras. Right, right. So again, Malbec is more purple. Malbec is just all of this wonderful sweet fruit and is not going to have nearly the herbal and green elements there unless it's underripe, in which case you're going to probably spit it out before you, uh, you swallow it. The nature of the fruit that you get in Cabernet Franc is, first of all, it's not so much a, a, a variety of, of pungent mixed greens or, or tobacco leaf, but it's more sort of a subtler thing. We talk about leafy and specifically bay leaf. You're also talking about fruit character that tends to be more red than black. Um, my, I usually find uh, black raspberry or raspberry. I find red and black cherry. Um, I find um, uh, at times almost a really ripe strawberry in certain Bourgoy wines, which you rarely if ever find in Carmenere. Uh, Evan, the chicory note that you mentioned, here's a question from Ben Katz. Would you say that that happens more in common air than other uh, Bordeaux varieties? Yeah, I, I find it I find it occasionally in Verdot. If you find Verdot, a Petit Verdot is a separate variety. I find it in um, Carmen air. Um, that's sort of what it brings to the party. It's not as, for lack of better words, refined a green character as you would find with the purity of bay leaf that I think is really the signature uh, flavor that you find in... Um, Cabernet Franc. So yeah, you get that kind of chicory spicy character. Chicory to me always has bite to it, which bay leaf wouldn't. Great. Awesome. All right. Madeline, I think you're up for the last wine of the day. Yes. And per usual, I have to move it along at a steady clip, but I will say this particular Carmenere and um, La Postole execution in general really changed my mind about Carmenere because I really had some old unfair thoughts um, of, uh, you know, subpar examples. And I think this one's gorgeous. And parting shot, it doesn't have the florality that I think Malbec will, with very rare exception, uh, have plenty of. So just yeah. a thought. Alrighty, wine number six, yay. And here we are, uh, more of the same, only different in terms of the appearance. If you just turn the glass, it stains the glass big time. And I can't see a damn thing through it from the very center that's like black red to the very rim where the hue doesn't change. It just lightens to, you know, something with purple glint. So just again, to remind us, um, red wines made from thick skin grape varieties start their life in barrel, um, you know, with blue and purple tones and then pick up true ruby red. And then it's there uh, inching towards maturity. That's where a little bit of the um, yellow or orange will creep in. And um, aromatically, <laughs> I'm laughing because I gotta tell you, here's the definition of complexity. You know, we look at all these categories that we use to define wine and this, this guy's got it. Fruit, spice, herbs, oak, you know, in rapid succession. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, define them after I take a little sip because I'm greedy. <laughs> and I really wanted to connect the sense of smell to the sense of taste. Also, when you're assessing quality of fruit, personal sommelier secret, make sure you hold it occasionally on your palate and you get mid palate plum line of flavor that really speaks to the quality of fruit. So, you know, this certainly is, I think, a mixture of red and black, maybe a little, even a little bit of blue in there, but black leads um, and just classic black raspberry, blackberry, but you know, on its heels, um, red raspberry and, you know, perfectly ripe, not verging into a dried or um, overripe. You know, certainly the acidity is sufficient uh, to keep the wine uh, balanced, but it doesn't pull your attention. The tannins, are drying, but they're not shutting the flavor of the wine down. 
Um, moving on to uh, spice and such, let's do herbs because especially aromatically, all of us are gardening these days, right? That combination of um, leaf and dirt is there. Um, if I were to isolate the specific uh, herbal tones, to me, it's dried leaves. You can define it as tea or tobacco and, and actually some fresh mint is in there that gives it um, a nice cool tone. Um, the inorganic and organic earth are beautifully melted into each other. I get an expression of graphite, especially on the palette. I'm still addicted to using lead pencils. <laughs> you know, I don't know if there's lead in them anymore, but there used to be. Um, and then that characteristic of um, forest floor, which is uh, more aromatic than um, on the palette. You certainly get an expression of oak, but the wine can handle it big time. There's probably a chunk of new oak on this. I couldn't find a specific text sheet on it, but it comes across um, as um, a little bit of the sweetness of vanilla and some sweet baking spices and a touch of cedar as well. But mid palette again, there's something that's lurking behind all the other overt elements and there's a teeny little bit of animal. I like using the French pronunciation on that. Um, a touch of leather and those of you who break out in hives when you even think you smell botanomyces, you've got to get over it because, you know, sometimes it's, frankly, <laughs> there's just a titch of it. Uh, it adds to the complexity. Mid palette's very, very deep. And I could go on and on, but in the interest of time, um, I would say this is a complex, full-bodied um, red with moderate to moderate plus acidity, moderate plus plus tannin, but, you know, uh, fine grained enough for the wine to come off round and smooth and simply uh, also because when that when the wine sits on your palate and you get an illusion of sweetness from that perfect ripeness in the black and red fruit, you know, that rounds the wine out. Uh, it's, by the way, a, I think a gorgeous example of type and also a reflection of uh, terrific vintage. So I'm the good cap, cop, so I always like to throw <laughs> out, you know, excessively generous hints. So go ahead and put that little poll up. This is a really cool option. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon slash blend, because they can be. This doesn't necessarily have to be a blend, um, though we mention it three times. It's just these grape varieties are often paired with their cousins. Uh, Tempranillo blend, Syrah blend. And I would um, invite you to go to the primal expression of these three grape varieties, starting with Syrah, you would ask yourself, certainly it can have deep color, certainly it can have black and red fruit, but does it have a thumbprint of a meaty, smoky and or peppery character that at least in the old world, Syrah rarely doesn't have, uh, particularly if it's the dominant variety in the blend. Um, Tempranillo, certainly if it's from the old world, AKA Rioja Ribera del Duero, well from Rioja, we're probably, but not always gonna be looking at not only the quantity of the oak, right? Um, but also the quality of the oak. Not always American oak, but often there's some in there. It doesn't dominate as much as it used to, but you're also gonna have significant oxidative, oxidative effect from um, uh, extensive uh, barrel aging. And then finally, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, you know, Cabernet is the little black elephant in the room, right? Uh, and it tends to push the other children <laughs> out of the way. So is it um, commanding your attention in this wine? Um, you know, speaking to the old world and new world, and I won't uh, overwork this Limang, but I will say that certainly new world wines can have um, plenty of terroir expression that involves uh, earthiness. And, you know, old world wines can be bereft of it. So it does, you know, it's getting a little bit trickier, but the examples that uh, the Master of the World team has given you tend to be pretty damn classic examples of type, meaning ones that are not only A plus in quality, but uh, are something that are worth memorizing. All right. I think that, I think that uh, this has been a confusing kit for some. Uh, looking at the choices here, you have paid pretty Ooh. much a third and a third on the three reds. And then looking at uh, old world versus new world, it's pretty much 50-50. You know um, what, can I speak to that real quick? Because bravo to the group 
you're honest, you're not easily led, you're paying attention to the wine. Um, all three of those varieties uh, come into play. I would say not to discourage. No, I won't even say that. We're gonna we're gonna reveal it. But I can absolutely looking at the old world, new world conundrum, um, because you have so much ripeness in this wine, and because there's plenty of new oak on it. Um, you know, you could easily go to the new world, and conversely, it could be a modern expression of old world. So you know. I don't think anybody's a loser in this. Shall we um, reveal? Absolutely. But that said, I think it's a pretty classic example of what it is. This one's worth memorizing, especially aromatically. Europe, southeastern, southwestern France, Bordeaux, specifically left bank, specifically the commune of Margot, that uh, has a well-deserved reputation for its uh, Cabernet dominated, but sometimes not more than 60%, you know, in a blend of um, blends that are famous for being supple, perfumed, elegant, fragrant, smooth, and balanced, you know, yay, who doesn't like all those? Um, this is um, actually, and uh, if you study Margot, you will see that there are three townships that come into play. Uh, three of them are closer to the river. Uh, and this one is from Arsac, which is a little bit further inland. But nonetheless, you know, why do we bring this up? Because the amount of gravel uh, is uh, a selling point for uh, the pedigree of terroir in, um, uh, on the left bank. This actually is a pretty modern estate that I wasn't familiar with until, thank you, Master of the World, I tasted it here. Um, this was created in 1980, so these guys haven't been around from, you know, the French Revolution, like you try to me uh, memorize the history of a lot of Bordeaux chateaux and estates. Gentleman by the name of Regis Reg Bernalo created this in 1980, and he purchased um, over 30 acres, a not all contiguous, prime Margot property um, in the... Um, community of Arsac. This is, oh, there's the gravel baby, you know, and what does it speak to? It speaks to drainage. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon loves it. And that's why, you know, it tends to be a lot more of it on the left bank than on the right bank where clay dominates. Um, this is where it gets interesting. And when you're reading stat sheets, don't get too married to percentages because depending on what, what you read, this estate is planted to 60% Cabernet, 38% Merlot but this vintage claims to be 70% Cabernet. And I find actually that a lot of the classified growth, this is a Cru Bourgeois inching into planting more Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, I will say that this is a 2019 and drum roll, you know, um, 2018 and 2019 mirrored this wonderful phenomena of 15 and 16 where you have the former, in this case, 18, being a little bit more ripe and opulent in its youth. Some um, from French sommeliers we call 2015, which I'm comparing 18 to an American vintage, which they like because it was very forward. And 2019 tends to have, uh, as 16 did, brighter acidity and more classically structured. And here's the lovely family that um, the father figure on the right who created the estate and his family who are um, a young son who seems to be poised to uh, take it uh, into the future. You know, I'm not blowing smoke uh, when I say this is worth really nesting with this wine over a couple, three days, especially if you, um, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful example of classic, modern in the best definition of this world, um, left bank Bordeaux, with uh, plenty of expression of terroir that's recognizable. Gentlemen, would you, uh, oh, I'm gonna answer this question. How do you get to Margot rather than the other left bank, AKA Poyac? I mean, again, we're generalizing, you know, it's not an exact science, but Poyac to me has a little bit more really aggressive black fruit, slightly more drying tannins and even stronger graphite expression. You know, Poyac to me is Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, the, the really the soul of it, the heart of it. Whereas I think Margot, the edges are a little softer, it's a little bit easier, um, certainly no, no less noble. I can always count on you, Madeline, to take us to the finish line on top. <laughs> I love it. Um, 
I'm going to just hold on questions. Evan is going to be here to answer anyone's extra questions. Evan's going to actually host the happy half hour all by himself today. So if you want to hang with Evan, uh, it's a good it's a good time. Um, until the next time, of course, I wanted to share that we have a webinar coming up for June 17th. We did sell out of 130A. So I know that some people couldn't get their hands on this, and uh, I am very sorry for that. If you're a subscriber, don't worry, you'll get your 131A. Uh, and that webinar is June 17th at 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, in our latest uh, newsletter, we also put out some very new items called our WSET uh, Wine Kits. If you didn't get a newsletter and you want to get one, um, I'm just going to put in the chat the email that you should write to to get our newsletter. Um, but we do have for subscribers a substantial discount if you want to get those WSET kids. And if you're not a subscriber, be one and you'll get those discounts. Um, last but not least, Father's Day, great option. We are going to be putting out a free shipping upgrade. Uh, it's getting hot out there. So if you're a subscriber, you will start seeing wines come to you with ice packs. Uh, we're starting to ship with ice depending on where you are this week. Uh, and then if you are further away, we're actually going to upgrade at our, our cost. And Father's Day, we're going to um, put it out there for those of you who are looking for Father's Day gifts, uh, free upgrade. Um, I think without further ado, I will just, if you can stay on, great. Uh, Evan and Tim, I didn't want to cut you guys off. If you wanted to add something about this wine before we head out. Tim, go, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I can't really add much more than Madeline uh, described the wine. I just thought it was glorious. I mean, especially for the price point. Uh, it's a reminder that too often we overlook Bordeaux and we need to return to it regularly because it will always surprise and amaze with the quality and just the depth and the value of the wines. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's always difficult to add to what Madeline says. I would just say that this is, you know, Margot's structure. You know, Margot to me is a very onomatopoetic wine. I mean, it tastes like a Margot. It just sort of roundly comes up. Poyac <laughs> sounds kind of hard, and Poyac <laughs> is hard. A lot of it's in the structure. You know, the, 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 the wines from Poyac um, tend to have a little bit more graphite, a little bit more cigar box. Those from Margot tend to be more opulent rounder but the tannins are not as drying they're, they're they they tend to be um smooth and easy and actually the next further stop after that is the grove and the grove is that even in more spades than uh than than margot is in terms of its elegance and softness and all that the further north you get the tougher they get if you end up in santa staff there there's a reason that uh, hugh johnson calls them the foot soldiers of the medoc because they are tough as nails so think about the geography there other than that thank everybody for coming i hope you enjoyed this kid i realized it was a bit more challenging than others but you know you want you don't want to a be predictable and b we want to push our boundaries and three we want to constantly learn grow and discover so i hope you did appreciate that in this kit next month's kit will be very different